Now, just a word about why we did not recommend the New King James Version as a Bible for your reading today. Uh, it's really quite simple. Uh, the King James Version, the New King James Version, both on manuscripts that date back to about 1100. And the King James Version was translated in 1611. The best manuscripts they had were dated back to 1100. And the modern translations, the new verse that we've referred to today, the English Standard, the New International Version, the New American Standard, they're all based on a lot of discoveries that have been made since the King James was translated. And since the King James was translated, our discoveries have taken us back closer and closer to the original manuscripts. Now, let me just say a word here about manuscript transmission or about Bible transmission. Uh, here's kind of says, that went on. You had the original autograph, the scholars call it, or the original copy. That was, let's say Paul's letter to the Romans or Matthew's gospel that was originally written. Let's kind of follow an imaginary course for Paul's letter to the Romans. Suppose he wrote a letter to the Romans. They received it from Phoebe. Uh, they kept it there a while and then then one brothers there in Rome made a copy of it. He made two or three copies of it. But let's suppose he sends his copy over to uh, Alexandria, for example. And then Alexandria reads it, and then the brother makes a copy. Or he may make more than one copy. Uh, the letter to the was not that long. It wouldn't have been a copy it's that long to make several copies of it. But anyway, after he makes his copy, he sends it on, on to another church. Maybe he sends it on back across the Mediterranean to Ephesus. And then some Ephesus makes a copy or several copies and sends one on to Corinth or then on somewhere else. And as keeps being repeated uh, over and over again, and let's say on the on the slide here, we've gotten down to the ninth generation copies. And so what it is when someone makes a copy and they seldom make a perfect copy. There are mistakes made or occasionally a copyist may insert something of his own. He may make a particular verse that quite makes sense and needs just another short statement to help round it out or help make it fit with something else. Uh, those call scribal errors in the case of mistakes and uh, scribal additions that may be made. And what you see is when you're dealing with manuscripts that have been going through this process for a thousand years, then the manuscripts you've got are going to contain uh, errors and mistakes. Now, it's amazing uh, that they didn't contain more than they did and that no, no doctrinal issue uh, was changed. And we know that because in the 19th and 20th centuries, there were deliveries made of manuscripts that were much older, manuscripts that took us back uh, much, much closer to the first century and to the original writings. And so those older manuscripts then have gone through a lot less of this transmission, and so there's a lot less likelihood of error. And so with those manuscripts, and we can go back and check the newer versions, new us, uh, to our time, the, say the 1100s, 
and we can see some mistakes, but we can also see that generally uh, PS were pretty faithful. It. But if you're going to make a translation today, what do you do? Do you want to make it, you want to base it on these manuscripts that date from about 1100, or do you want to make, make it that translation based on manuscripts that are much closer to the original? And so that's the reason we wouldn't recommend uh, either the King James Version or the New King James Version as kind of a, a Bible that you rely on and, and study deeply, particularly for doctrinal and ethical issues. So we've said that tool number one is good translations. Now then, let's talk about tool number two. Two is background material. You find this in a variety of places. Uh, I will always remember what uh, my one of my early professors in graduate school said. Now keep in mind this is back in 1969, but he was talking about the New Testament, and he said when you read the New Testament, take off your 20th century glasses on your century glasses. In other words, don't try to read the text if it were written in the 20th century. Read text as though it were written in the first century. And as one person has put it, the mind of the reader must acculturated to the world of the Bible to get in. Now, that's very difficult for us to do. Others talk a lot about the fact that there's the text and that there's the distance between the text and the reader. And the reader, the distance is between the text and the reader. The bridging it is, and the more the reader must work to go and to try to understand what was going on at the time of the text. Uh, look, uh, something that happened uh, 100 years ago in 1917 in the United States, and you read something about that, uh, you would need to try to go that distance and get back in into what was the United States like in 1917? Was that the era, was the era leading up to the roaring 20s and, and the, the flowers and all that stuff? Uh, and you got to put yourself back in that culture in order to understand what the text is saying. Well, for those of us, we've got to go after finding other tools to do that. None of us just intuitively or naturally knows what the world of first century was like. Just some places where you can go to this kind of background material. You can find it sometimes in Bible dictionaries and encyclopedias. Uh, you're reading about Ephesus, you know, the letter to the Ephesians. Well, in a dictionary, you'll find a description of Ephesus and what was founded and uh, this when it was kind of laid waste and and read between, and you read information, and then generally you can get down to reading what it was like in the first century. Uh, Bible dictionaries or Bible encyclopedias will give you that kind of information. Now, you can go buy the hard copies of those things, which are generally very, very large, and as a result, very expensive. Uh, or today, you can take advantage of the fact that many of these things are already available free on the web. Sometimes you can buy an electronic version of these kinds of things uh, much less expensive, that are much less expensive. The other thing study Bibles, which will often give you, uh, before you start reading, like the book of Romans, introduction to the book of Romans. Just always keep in mind the introduction is not part of the Bible. It's, it's been put within the same um, as the Bible, but remember it's not inspired. It, there may be mistakes in it. We'll talk more study Bibles, and we'll actually treat Bibles as a third category here in a moment. The other place you can get background material are in commentaries. Uh, William Barclay was a, a Scottish scholar uh, years ago, 
Uh, he wrote most of his commentaries um, much more than 50 years ago, maybe 50, 60 years ago. And I think it's just called the Daily Bible Study Series. Uh, Bark himself was kind of a liberal when it came to Scripture. He will often try to explain some of the miracles away very naturalistically. Instead of it being a miracle, it just happened to be something that naturally happened and sort of looked like a miracle. So a lot of people repeat the story that way. But he's very good on two things. He's very good on Bible backgrounds. He knew a lot of what was going on in the place at the time. He's also very good on Greek words, uh, talking typically about what certain words in a passage really not how it was used historically, how it may have been used by Plato and Aristotle, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, so he's good. His books are good for background. Uh, they're always good for some other things. Uh, there is a, a background commentary. Uh, I've got a picture of it there on the screen uh, that is available. In fact, uh, it's quite popular. Uh, the author insists up front at the beginning that he's not trying to interpret the passages for you like most commentaries would try to do. He's trying to give you the background on each verse so that you can use that to interpret. So it become a very useful tool for you. And then finally, there's a great deal of background material available on the internet, and we'll set that for its own category as well. So let's go move on to a, another category. I mentioned this when I mentioned Barclay. But that is, there are books that are devoted to word studies. Uh, words in Hebrew language, word studies uh, from, from Greek vocabulary. And very useful to those who don't know Greek or Hebrew. Uh, in the case of Vines, the words are based on the King James Version. Suppose you were reading something in the NIV, as I'm showing here in Colossians. You read Colossians 2.9 in the NIV, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And what, what, what about that word deity or deity? What did that really mean? If you want to do a deeper word study of that. Well, you're going to need to go, if you look up deity in the vines, you're probably going to find it. Uh, but if you look at a King James Version, which is freely available on the web, easy to find, for all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And by the only version of the Bible that uses the word Godhead is the King James Version. It's used two or three times in the King James Version. So then you find there's your word that you saw here in your NIV, and it's Godhead in the King James. And so you go to Vines, and just you use it just like a dictionary. You, you find it alphabetically, and you look at the word Godhead, and then you'll see the Greek word. He'll have in Greek, in the Greek letters, but if you don't read those Greek letters, he'll analyze it for you and tell you how to pronounce it in English, and then he'll go into some depth about what that word meant and how it was used. Terry mentioned to me another tool, a linguistic key to the Greek Testament by a couple of different guys, uh, Riker and Rogers. Uh, I'm not familiar with it. I've never used it, and I looked it up on the web to see if I could get it. And it's out of print, but you buy some used copies. But sometimes a, a book like this in, in used, it'll, it'll say available from anywhere from like $20 to $75, something like that. But I did want to pass that on because Terry at least a copy and has found it very useful. Then the category that we'll talk about uh, after word studies would be study Bibles. Uh, Bibles are Bibles that combine the Bible, a lot of other introductory material, and a lot of other notes. Uh, background material. And so the advantage is you've got in one volume sitting there on your table, you've got the text of the NIV study Bible. There's a ESV study Bible. There's a Holman 
study Bible. But the text, uh, the NIV or the ESV or the Holman Creator Bible. Then you got a lot of material like maps and charts and other background information that help you understand the culture at the time. And then you'll have footnotes on, on the textual information. And so you may read a particular verse out of Acts, uh, Acts chapter 2, let's say 38. It's saying that when you do something like that, you'll go to the footnote of some of these Bibles and they will explain away or they will not even deal with some verses we found very significant and very important. But you remember as you, that you are reading commentary. Sometimes the commentaries will be very helpful to you. But you always remember what you, that's the word of caution I have at the bottom of the page here. Uh, always remember that. I think the best of these, uh, and I've not examined all of these uh, carefully, but it looks to me like the best might be the NIV Zondervan Bible. It's the Bible. It's the uh, newest one out, and they tend to make a lot of improvements each time that they do these. There's Holman Christian Standard Study Bible and the ESV Study Bible. And, uh, they are very useful to you. Now let me mention here that the electronic editions of these study Bibles may be the way you want to go. Number one, they're usually cheaper to buy them electronically uh, to put on your computer. They're not great to try to use on your phone. You can use them on your, your iPad or your Kindle. Not great to try to use them on your phone. Uh, the times have a lot of charts and things that just don't work out that, that way on your telephone. But uh, the value of these is they use the hyperlinks, like I said, you would find in the New English Translation. And so you don't have to spend a lot of time looking up those footnotes. You can just go on them and then read them. Then you click on it again. It takes you right back to the text. But a C Bible can be a very valuable source for you. But just in mind what's biblical and what's added by somebody else. Then, uh, so you might be interested in buying, and which was a valuable tool for me a long, for a long, long time, and the concordance. Uh, many of you, in, in many study Bibles, there will be a concordance in the back, and that will be something that will take the word hope, or see on the screen here, the word boy, and it lists any of the passages that have that word joy in it, or the word hope in it, or if it's a uh, complete accordance. It'll list every word. That's a very large volume. Uh, but uh, you don't need this particular tool that much today because most of the internet tools that we're going to discuss here in just a moment will themselves uh, tear of that need. But if you don't use the internet, you don't use the uh, computer much, then a concordance may be a very valuable tool for you. Maybe you're trying to locate a verse, and you think you can remember one or two words in that verse, but you can't can't think of any more. Well, often you can go to the concordance, and you can kind of glance down the list, and there you'll see the verse that you were trying to find it in. That you're trying to find, so that be useful. Then finally, we turn to internet tools or Bible software that you can put on your computer. I'm going to talk mostly about internet tools. And most of these, of course, are free, which uh, makes it really amazing. I can remember being back years ago, uh, before many of these internet things became available, $100 for some Bible software. And now it's, it's all available or much of it is. Now you can still buy other Bible software that will do more than some of these things will, but uh, a lot of things are available to us. So the first I want to mention to you that I find extremely valuable is called Bible Hub. This way it used to be called Biblos. It went to the name BibleHub.com. 
and so write down and be sure and check it out. You may end up deciding you don't want to use it that much, but I would really encourage you to check it out. Give me just some examples of what you can find on Bible Hub. Okay, first of all, you drew, use a drop down menu, locate the book of the Bible you want to study. Then it'll give you another drop down menu where you can pick on chapter five, and then another one where you can pick on chapter six, or it'll give you a place just up at the top where you can just type that in. If you don't like typing and you just want to use your mouse, then you can just find it this way. Okay, what you do when you click on that, then it brings up the passage, and it brings up first have it in the New International Version, and it'll having it in the New Living Translation. Uh, I, I do remember now uh, with the new statistics that are out, I have heard that the New Living Translation is now a number two behind the New International Version sales, and I guess that means it's surpassed the King James version. But I'll give you, you know, these three, and if we had the ability if I were online right at the moment, I could keep scrolling, and I could scroll down to 26 different translations, and we could read Ephesians 5, 6, let no one deceive you with empty words, because of the things, these things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. We could read that at 20 plus Verse. The other thing about uh, the Bible, if you look in on a word here that you want to do more study on, if no one deceive you, and you want to go deeper into your understanding of what that word is, then you can do it a couple of different ways. But uh, you you can around with this, you'll find the different ways to do it. But you can come here to while you're this verse on your main page, you come up here and you click on lexicon. And when you click on lexicon, it gives you the whole sentence that's looked at uh, lined up this way. It was the New American Standard version of that, let no one deceive you. There's the receive. It will then have it spelled out in Greek letters, and have it spelled out in the anglicized version version, how we would pronounce it, and then have uh, Strong's Concordance number, which we'll come to in just a moment, and you have a very short definition of it, and then uh, finally you have a little bit about the origin of that word, you what uh, Greek word it comes from, and then that also is a hyperlink. It, it gives you the word it's from, and then you can click on that word, the original word, and you can go look it up. Say we click on the strong concordance number here, see where where that takes us. Once you've done the strong concordance number there, it takes you to the page in, in Strong's Concordance, which was is a older work but a well known work, uh, go depth into the meaning of Greek words. And so once you get into Strong's you find a lot more material here about that word and it tell you other places it's used it will tell you places it's other places it's used in the new testament and it becomes a very valuable resource to just do a lot more study uh that's bibs are what it is bible hub uh i hope i don't have yeah i've got something out of line here i thought i probably did uh, but uh to get much more into bible hub I did a 10-minute tutorial years ago when Crawford and I were teaching the book of Philippians online, and people were wanting to know more about how to use a Bible Hub. And so I did a 10-minute tutorial on it. I'll attach a link to the next mailing that goes out this week if you want to understand more about how Bible Hub works. If you want to be able to watch it and stop the, the uh, screen and catch on a bit better, uh, you'll want to go to that. Just to mention some other useful internet tools. Uh, many of you I know already use Bible Gateway. It's an excellent tool. It's got all kinds of resources, you know, but you can go up here and enter a word 
you can do a word search, you type in love, you type in grace, you type in redemption. Uh, it will bring up uh, all the place where that is found. You can also search by uh, in a similar way to Bible Hub. I just find Bible Hub to be one that, that I can work with a lot more easily. But you, you may enjoy Bible Gateway. Another one is called uh, the uh, Blue Letter Bible. It's one I've not used very much, but just in looking at it, it's a lot of useful resources on it. Uh, many of these will have Bible dictionaries, things to get your background material on. Uh, I'm sure that after you play around for a while with them, you'll, you'll probably develop one that's your favorite, but you'll find that that other one will have some other uses for you along these. Uh, one that's not as well known, I find, is called just Bible.org. One of the best one of the things that it's known most for is it's the website that was associated with publication of the New English Translation, the Net Bible, the one I mentioned that was done to, to be deline entirely. And so if you go to Bible org, Bible.org, you'll find one of the links there is to take you right on in to the Net Bible. But it has a lot of biblical based articles, probably more than anywhere I know. And they come from a variety of viewpoints. And so remember to, to check your reading. Don't swallow everything down whole. You'll find some stimulating and useful articles. You'll find Bible studies. There, there's some sermons, a lot of sermons that are listed there, and many other resources. Uh, Someone I do. A a Google search for something, and where I'm going to end up here, it will end up giving me the first one or two things it gives me is to take me back to something on Bible.org. And so I do want to just mention Google, and that's uh, you can use that. Most of us are able to use it on our phone. Uh, for example, you're trying to think, where is the passage where Jesus said, I came not to be served, but to serve? Where is that? We can just say, that, you know, with your microphone. Phone. Uh, and you say Siri, where, where is that? Or, or Google, find pa this passage for me. Not just say it, say the words, and it will often bring up something, and then a whole lot of articles. Uh, when I did this one, not be served, but to serve, it brought up you know the immediate plus Matthew twenty twenty to twenty eight, and Mark ten thirty five to forty. Uh, but then you know how Google does this and. And 4 million other sites, well, you don't have time to check all that out, but it will bring up the more immediate things, of course, that you need. So those are our Bible tools that we to you. Are those all there, there are? Probably not. I don't know all the tools that are out there. I keep finding uh, new ones. And uh, uh, you may know them great ones that I don't know of. I hope you will email me uh, and let me know what those are. Go up for a moment. Out of the world of book technology, not just you and me and, and our boss. Deep breath. Go deep breath. <laughs> Let's talk about something that is just as important more important than our tools. We need to go get a toolbox, resources that are going to help us understand things, but we need to bring a great heart to everything we study the Bible. This is more important than any tool. And let's watch and do a little Bible study on it to help us with this whole attitude of bring a great heart to me. Let's go to Timothy chapter 1 and give you a little bit of context here. Paul is writing to his young disciple Timothy and he gives him some instructions. Most likely, Timothy, in 1 Timothy, is uh, uh, in If you go background study, you understand why we, we conclude that. Paul's time, Timothy 
you're kind of directing, leading a church. Paul's about saying certain things. He wants to stop these men and get involved and confront these men who are teaching false things and are from controversies that touch on myths and irrelevant information, and all they do is cause trouble. Said that, that that whole section, but he's already said that much. But he says this in verse five: the go this command, command the come to stop this kind of teaching that's going on, that's coming from these false teachers. The goal of this command is love, which from a pure heart, a good sense, sincere faith. Faith. Some have way from these earned meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they know what they're talking about, or they so confidently affirm. Now here we are. About two A.D. We've got, according to Paul here, some people who want to be teachers of the law. Now, that's another whole study there. What did they mean during this period of Christian uh, covenant, the new covenant? What did they mean they wanted to be teachers of the law? Well, that's that's another whole study. To see how that involved the scriptures, these people that wanted to be teachers of the scriptures, and so wanted to be teachers of the scriptures, you would assume they've been studying the scriptures. But some the line, these people have wandered away from where they started. And they wandered away, Paul says, from a pure heart, from a good sense, and a sincere faith. He says, the goal of my command is love, which comes from these three things. Can't love unless you've got a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Not, not God, with God's kind of love. There are people who still want to be teachers, want to be very involved in the scriptures, want to be teaching other people, not studying the scriptures, away from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. They may still know a lot about the facts down here. They from where their heart need to be. The Paul says is that they don't know what they're talking about or what they confidently affirm. And so we now seventeen admitted to Jesus. Those who studied the scriptures at a great place. A child can wander away from his parents in a mall. Like all my kids do that when they were growing up. We'd have malls back in those days. I'm going to have malls in the future. They've stopped building them. But I saw one, one dad just kind of let her go and followed her and watched her just wander away. From, from we get more and more into other stuff. And wander away from a pure heart. Are, are we we wander away by let certain uh, things happen in the church and we don't deal with them, and walls build up, and 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 our consciences are seared, and our our heart is no longer pure because it becomes hard. Whatever whatever happens, we can wander away so that we're not able to show God's love. And no matter how much of the fact. We've learned over here in our Bible study. We don't know what we're talking about. God, or confidently affirm. Be one has a text of study and teaching. And roll up of it. In the midst of all this, Paul says the goal of this command I'm giving you is love. That come heart, good conscience. In most of the 
academic fields in this world, your study is completely unrelated to your love. You can a PhD, you can go on to graduate studies, you can be an expert in your field, you can get tenure in the university, you can be head of a department, and that's what you do in, in history, or geology, or he has nothing to do with whether you be a person who loves like God. But just stay with our Bible study. The person who sees but doesn't love does harm than good. Just out of context, but aware of the context here. First Corinthians eight one, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. And Edge Paul is talking about there is a is a particular kind of knowledge that certain Corinthians were claiming to have. But he's certainly related to the knowledge we're talking about gaining in our Bible study. Over that speed and knowledge, it can puff up if it's aligned with, with love. And so we need to bring to our study a great heart, a heart that's filled with love, a pure heart, a good conscience, a sincere faith. And our lives need to be discipled in an ongoing way by each other and by God. So we're, we're keeping that heart on the inside pure. That's what's going to enable us to see clearly as we read the scriptures. Otherwise, we'll get pushed on with some of those outer rings I talked about last week. And, we'll, and, and our focus on some of those outer rings will end up bringing us into controversial discussions with other people that become divisive. We've got to keep our eyes on the center of the target. Two others that I'll mention here that really help us have the right heart in study would be James 1.21. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. And humbly accept the word that is in you, which can save you. As we see scripture, it needs to be with a spirit of humility that receives the word. Not to argue with it, not to fight. We may be sometimes perplexed by it, but not to refute it, but to humbly accept it. There's Peter 2, verses 2 and 3. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that you may grow up in your salvation now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. We need to approach Scripture with a hunger, with an eagerness. Eagerness on our part going to come and go sometimes, yeah. But when we find ourselves slipping, we need to remind ourselves what we're studying, why we're studying, and go back to it with a great heart. So, heart, more important than any tool. The tool is valuable, but only use them with a great heart. Seven is to ask. I think Paul is the first person who put this in a book. Sam Lang later quoted it in his book on having great quiet times, Be Still My Soul. Is there a promise here to claim? Is there a command here to obey? Sin to be avoided or to repent of. Is there anything about God, Jesus, the Spirit, some other biblical topic here that I need to really take hold of? It's for me to follow. Follow, or in some cases, is there an example here for me to avoid? Is there a difficulty for me to uh, 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 study more, to explore? Is there a difficulty for me to write this verse down and say I want to study this verse more because I don't, I don't really understand how that's related to some other things I've studied? And something in this passage that I need to pray about today. These are all useful things. Great, great heart, lead productive Bible study, and to grow in our salvation to spiritual growth. Before us, I want you to read those chapters. Then the Fee Stewart book. I'll uh, we'll be talking about studying the Old Testament law. 
be talking about narrative, particularly in the Old Testament, but even in the New Testament. Read chapters 5 and chapter 9 uh, in your book. And that we'll be posting these recordings on the web for anyone who wants them. And if you have any trouble getting the link, just write us at the Greater Nashville Church. Thank you for being with us today. We're having you with us for lesson number three that will be taught by my college next week.